the Rock and Roll Unravel Show. I'm Derek Shelmerdine. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unravel Show. Now, rock and roll emerged in the mid 1950s as an amalgam of both black and white musical roots. That's gospel, blues, jazz, jump blues, R&B, doo-wop, and then country, hillbilly, rockabilly, and bluegrass, and that all fused and more subgenres to produce rock and roll. Now, today we're going to be taking a look at the early R&B scene. That's the R&B scene before the advent of rock and roll in the mid 1950s. It all started with gospel music. Now, after the American Civil War in the mid-19th century, people moved north from the uh, plantations and they moved up to places like St. Louis, Chicago, Memphis. And by the end of the 19th century, the music was really starting to develop and the syn syncopated rhythms of ragtime and the improvisational nature of jazz, well, they'd arrived. In 1928, James Boodlet uh, Wiggins, now that's a name to conjure with, he recorded a song called Keep a Knockin' and You Can't Get In, and that's the original version of that. You might recognise the title, it was covered famously by Little Richard uh, quite, quite a while later. And in the 30s, the vocal harmony groups started popping up. I mean, the Mills Brothers uh, released their Tiger Rag on Brunswick. Now, it's the same label that the Who recorded their early material on. That's been around a while. That was uh, December 31, and that was considered to be jazz. Now, the term R&B wasn't coined until the late 40s, but more about that later. And in 35, the Ink Spots were in the recording studios at um, RCA in New York. And amongst the things they recorded on that 4th of January was swinging on strings and don't allow no swinging in here. Now, that was a skiffle favourite in the UK in the 50s. Mama don't allow. But the, the hard times of the 1930s drove many of the swing uh, jazz big bands out of business. And jump blues came along and it filled the gap. Now what happened was that the patrons of the dance halls needed smaller groups who could sort of match the volume of the departed big bands. And the singers would shout and the saxophonists would honk and that gave the performance names like Shouters and Honkers. A wonderful time. And jump blues was a sort of up tempo jazz tinged style of blues usually a vocalist in front of a large horn driven orchestra or a medium-sized combo with uh, multiple horns you can see a theme developing here now the style was earmarked by driving rhythm uh, loud vocals and saxophones lyrics full of bravado and swagger and a lot less reliance on guitar the guitar now very much became a a rhythm guitarist um, situation and jump blues also had a, a hard rhythmic drive and the snare beat emphasis was on the two and the four very much a precursor of um, rock and roll a jump blues bridged the gap really between the older style of blues and the the big band sounds of the 1930s and innovators here were people like joe turner louis jordan now the term r&b wasn't coined until the late 1940s and there was a massive overlap between the various genres blues, jazz, jump blues, doo wop, R and B. And the crossover from one genre to another is really quite um hazy. So we're not going to concern ourselves too much with trying to pigeonhole artists and and tracks. But in nineteen thirty nine a guy called Rodney Sturgis released So Good on the Decca label, another label that's been around a long time. And now he was backed by Louis Jordan's Elks Rendezvous Band. Now, Louis Jordan became a big player in the 1940s with his uh, Timpani Five. They had 57 R&B hits on the Billboard R&B Top 40. We need to remember, though, that the Top 40 Billboard R&B hits didn't start until 1942. So he would have had um, a lot more than 57 between his 42 and 51 because he was recording very much in the 1930s. Now, in March 1939, one of his earlier ones was Louis Jordan and his Timpani Five with Keep a Knockin'. 
and the label information is great it describes it as blues vocal foxtrot and keep a knocking and you can't get in mentioned earlier was um, around from 1928 with the original by james boodlet wiggins and little richard's cover in 1957 and an awful lot of covers between 39 and 57 i can say now louis jordan is timpani five he managed to get two songs into the rock and roll hall of fame's 500 songs that shaped rock and roll uh, one was Caldonia from 1945. That was his 11th R&B hit, and that was the number one for seven weeks. And in 1949, he had uh, the wonderfully titled Saturday Night Fish Fry, parts one and two, so both sides of the single. Um, that was his 50th R&B hit. As you remember, he had his last um, R&B hit in 1951, uh, and that was number one for 12 weeks. So across the 40s, he was very very popular and for our opening track on today's show i thought we'd have to go for louis jordan's 1939 take on keep a knocking r&b was born in the mid 1940s in the clubs of st louis in memphis now st louis was a large wealthy city and it can employ um, a larger number of uh, jazz and blues musicians and r&b really was evolving out of the simpler blues music adding more instruments it was it was more upbeat it was very much designed for dancing and Big Joe Turner was um, coming into the frame now in 1945. He had his um, first R&B hit with SK Blues. And one of the most influential of the record labels was also born in 1947. And that was Atlantic Records, formed in New York by Armut Ertegen and Herb Abramson. And apparently they paid 3 to 5% royalties when other labels were paying less than 2%. And one of the earliest tracks I can find released on the Atlantic Records label was St. Louis Blues by Boyd Rabin. But they had their first big hit with Stick McGee and his buddies in uh, April 1949. And that was with Drinking Wine Spodio D. And that gave Atlantic its first big hit, uh, a number two. Now, Drinking Wine Spodio D was originally courted by Stick McGee in 1947, but the label there credits it as just Stick McGee and his buddy. So, obviously, he made a few friends before moving on to uh, Atlantic and recording it again a couple of years later. Another real classic hit the streets in 1947, and that was Roy Brown with Good Rockin' Tonight. Now, he wrote it and originally released it, but it didn't really do a lot until Winoni Harris picked it up in the middle of 1948. And he had a, a number one. It was his third R&B hit and of course Elvis chose it as his second Sun single and it didn't actually take it into the charts but the September of 1954 saw Elvis releasing Good Rocking tonight. Now Do What developed as a sort of sub-genre of R&B. What it was was very much the the birth of um, vocal arrangements with an overall uh, feel of um, R and B harmonies used falsetto, tenor leads, and interesting enough, at the <laughs> other end of the scale, as it were, the bass vocals became more prominent. Uh, they were given a lot more prominence than just background vocals, and the doo wop lyrics as well were less suggestive in R and B, less raunchy. They were more sort of up tempo, innocent love songs, but they did use a lot of nonsense syllables. Now, the term R&B is accredited to DJ Gus Gossett, and in, a, in an interview, he said it was a phrase he heard in a 1955 song from the Turbans, When You Dance. Now, the big bang of R&B is really credited to have come with uh, the Ravens. And they had a lead bass vocalist called Jimmy Ricks, and they were the guys that introduced dance steps into performing and these dance steps proved very popular with the uh, the later Motown bands, if you watch people like The Temptations and The the Four Tops. But the Ravens released their first single in the summer of 1946, Honey, and their first R&B hit came 
a little later, the beginning of 1948, with Write Me a Letter. And another big band at that particular time was the Orioles. They had their first single reviewed in Billboard magazine on the 4th of September 1948. And Billboard chose it as one of, of, one of their Billboard picks. Uh, it's a, a new release, most likely to sort of gain airplay and chart, and they were quite right. It's made the number one spot. Now, the Orioles and the Ravens weren't the first successful black vocal groups. They were preceded, as we heard earlier, by the Ink Spots and the Mills Brothers in the 1930s. But by the end of the 1940s, there was a new era of much more earthy black vocal groups. And the Orioles and the, the Ravens were right at the forefront of this new style that really came, and this was the style that became known as doo-wop. And they were followed by a multitude of sort of street corner vocal groups. Some going on to international fame, <laughs> not many, but sadly the genre generated a plethora of uh, one-hit wonders. And as the 50s became the 60s, doo-wop ran its course. Although the last Orioles hit came long before that, that was in 1953, uh, with in the mission of St. Augustine. Now I mentioned earlier that the term R&B was coined in the late 40s. Well, to be precise, it was coined on the 25th of June 1949 by Billboard magazine, because that was the date that it changed the name of its charts from race music to rhythm and blues. And the guy responsible for this name change was Jerry Wexler. Now, in the 40s, America was a very, very segregated place. Even the charts differentiated between black and white artists. RCA Victor, the record label, had really started this uh, trend away from the use of the word race music the year earlier, 1948, and they'd started to market its race music as blues and rhythm. But Billboard magazine, I say, 25th of June 1949, that was when the chart's name changed and the best-selling retail race records chart became the best-selling retail rhythm and blues records and the most played jukebox race records chart became most played jukebox rhythm and blues records. Uh, Jerry Wexler actually went on to join Atlantic in 1953. He was brought in when Herb Abramson, one of the founding members, was drafted into the army. And he was brought in very much to produce R&B for black audiences, to extend the, the reach of the record label. And one of the biggest artists of that time was uh, Ruth Brown. She had her first R&B hit in the summer of 49 with um, So Long. And in fact, she was so successful there that Atlantic Records became known as the house that Ruth built. And one of the most successful artists uh, in that era was Fats Domino. Now, on the 10th of December 1949, he recorded The Fat Man. It was written by Fats Domino and Dave Bartholomew. And that day he recorded eight tracks at uh, Cosimo Matassa's J&M Studios in New Orleans. And one of those tracks, The Fat Man, gave him his first R&B hit, gave him a number two. And The Fat Man's very much a contender for the title of the first rock and roll record. Now, Fats Domino's estimated to have sold over 65 million records. And essentially, he sold more records than any other 50s rock and roller, with the exception of Elvis Presley. And this is Fats Domino with a fat man. You're listening to Derek Shelmerdine with the Rock and Roll Unraveled show. Now, today we're taking a look at the early R&B scene. That's how it was before the advent of rock and roll in the mid-1950s. Now, around 1950, a doo-wop group called the Royals formed, and that was with Levi Stubbs. Now, he went on to form the Four Tops in 1954, although they were called the Four Aims when they first got together. Now, another very, very influential R&B record label, Chess Records, and it was the mid-50s when Aristocrat became Chess Records. And that was the Chess Brothers, Leonard and Phil. They took complete control of the Aristocrat label and renamed it to Chess Records. And the first Chess release was 
Bless You, coupled with My Foolish Heart by Gene Ammons. And instead of being given the record number Chess 1, it was given the number Chess 1425. And that was taken from their childhood address of the Chess family home at 1425 South Karloff Street in Chicago. And the second release on Chess is an interesting one. And of course, this is Chess 1. 426 and that was muddy waters self-penned rolling stone and this was the inspiration for brian jones for the name of the new lineup and that was the lineup after mick jagger and keith richard joined and they debuted as the rolling stones famously at the marquee in london on the 12th of july 1962 and one of the great r&b singles from the early 50s in may 51 uh, was 60 minute man from the dominoes it was actually their second r&b hit but it gave them a number one for 14 weeks and that's another one of the contenders for the accolade of first rock and roll record the lineup was billy ward and the lead vocals are from founder clyde mcfatter now he went on to form the the drifters and we keep talking about the contenders for the first rock and roll record well 5th of march 1951 jackie brenston recorded rocket 88 and that's very much cited as the first rock and roll record and it was written by jackie brenston recorded at sam phillips memphis recording service studio and it was released on chess because at that time Sam Phillips hadn't actually got his Sun Records into gear. Now, the session was arranged to record Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm, actually arranged by Ike Turner. And Turner's band cut four tracks that day. Piano player Turner took the lead vocal on Heartbroken and Worried and I'm Lonesome Baby. And that was coupled and released as a single by Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. And sax player Jackie Brenston took lead vocal on Rocket 88, and that was coupled with Come Back Where You Belong, and released as Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats. Now on the record, you've got some great fuzz guitar from Willie Kizat, and that's one of the first examples of um, deliberate distortion on a, a rock and roll record. And shortly afterwards, Bill Haley and his Saddlemen, before they were Bill Haley and his Comets, uh, covered the song. And Rocket 88? Well, that was actually a motor car. It was the Oldsmobile Rocket Hydromatic 88. And that went into the charts on the 12th of May 1951. And it was actually Jackie Brenston's first and only R&B hit. Another one-hit wonder. Uh, gave him a number one for five weeks. And one of the really influential people of the times was Alan Freed, uh, a DJ. And he started his R&B show on the 11th of July 1951. And that was on radio station WJW in Cleveland, Ohio. He was calling himself Moondog at the time. And he was one of the first American DJs to popularize R&B and introduce it to a wider white audience. He called his show the Moondog Rock and Roll House Party. And the show's theme was Blues for Moondog by Todd Rhodes. Now, Alan Freed's accredited with coining the term rock and roll, although a guy called Richard Whiting actually wrote a song called Rock and Roll back in 1934. That's uh, an interesting thought to ponder on. Throughout the 1940s, Freed appeared on radio and television as a sports presenter and DJ, and he was encouraged by local record store owner Leo Mintz to sort himself out with his own R&B show at uh, WJ. W, and as popularity of rock and roll music increased, he became one of the most influential DJs on radio and television. I mean, his activities themselves actually expanded out, and he was promoting concerts, uh, he was making movies. He had to drop the name Moondog after he was threatened with a lawsuit from Louis Thomas Moondog Hardin. Now, he was a legendary street performer who moved to New York in the early 1940s. And you could find him resplendent in Viking cape, helmet and complete with a spear as he performed at the corner of 54th Street and 6th Avenue in New York. Now, in 1952, there was a doo-wop song 
called Stormy Weather, released by the Five Sharps on the Jubilee label. It's quite possible you've never heard of this record. You've almost certainly never actually heard it. I know I haven't. And it's considered to be one of the, well, if not, the rarest doo-wop record of all. And that apparently sold in, ni- in 2003 for $19,000. So check the attic. There might well be something up there. And 1952 was the dawn of uh, a great artist's career. Sonny Wilson released the Rainy Day Blues on DG Records. Now, Sonny Wilson was actually Jackie Wilson. It wasn't here for him at the time, and that DG label was owned by Dizzy Gillespie. But in 1958, Jackie Wilson scored his first R&B hit, To Be Loved, and went on to have a phenomenal career. And one of the really great songs of the time, which you will definitely recognise, 13th of August 1952, Willie May, Big Mama Thornton, recorded Hound Dog. It was her only R&B hit, yet another one hit wonder, but it was number one for seven weeks. So if you're going to have a single hit, that's the way to do it. And it was one of Lieber and Stoller's earliest compositions, and he was backed by the Johnny Otis Band. Now, the original writing credit gave it to Lieber Stoller and Johnny Otis, but Lieber and Stoller took a very dim view of this, and by the time the Elvis version hit the streets in 1956, Otis's name was was no longer there, and Elvis had a, a top 40 pop hit with that. That was at number one for 11 weeks, and it was his seventh top 40 hit. But this is the original version. This is Big Mama Thornton and Hound Dog. There's another Elvis connection with our next record. The Orioles, with what was their 10th R&B hit, actually their penultimate R&B hit, in August of 53, they found themselves back in the R&B charts. This time it was with Crying in the Chapel. It's often said to be originally by the Orioles, but the actual original was by a guy called Daryl Glenn. He released it a month or so earlier. Now, he didn't manage to make the pop or the R&B charts. But the Elvis connection, well, he had a number three with that in 1965. So many of these doo-wop and R&B songs were covered by uh, bands and artists in the 1960s. Absolutely incredible. A wealth of uh, great music came out of this era. Now, on the 7th of May, 1953, Clyde McFatter signed to Atlantic after that was, he just left Billy Ward and the uh, Dominoes. And he had a mandate to put together a new group. And that's when he formed the, uh, the first Drifters lineup. And they recorded um, a number of songs, that first lineup, one of which was the McFatter penned Lucille. <laughs> but the... Uh, Good suits at Atlantic were very disappointed with the result and sacked the band, with the exception, obviously, of uh, Clyde. And he put together a new lineup with uh, Bill Pinky, Andrew Bubba Thrasher, and his brother Gerhardt, and Willie Furby, who was actually arguably a classic Drifters lineup. And they recorded uh, Money Honey. Now, Money Honey took them into the charts in October 53, and they were the number one spot with that for 11 weeks. Now, the label credit's interesting. It's Clyde McFatter and the Drifters, not simply the Drifters. And the Drifters is a really interesting band. I mean, they make a whole show in themselves. They went through a multitude of um, personnel. I mean, over 60, 65, 66, I think. And they're still performing to this present day, but there have been... No, numerous versions of the Drifters performing simultaneously. Now, they actually also included half a dozen lead singers, and they, they, they had a complete personnel change overnight on the 30th of May 1958, when the band was sacked in its entirety and re- replaced with uh, Benny King's band, who were renamed to the Drifters. But in the May of 53, the Spaniels recorded... Baby It's You. It d- did give them a hit, but the really interesting thing about this was that was the birth of the VJ 
record label and it's very famous because when the Beatles started having hits in the UK their producer George Martin went over to America to talk to Capital which is the sort of uh, parent company of um, or the sister company rather than the parent of uh, Parlophone that they recorded on the UK uh, to interest them in releasing the Beatles on Capital but Capital thought that um, there was no mileage in the Beatles they wouldn't sell any records so VJ picked up the the Beatles. They never actually scored any hits in that um, year before Capital picked them up. But well done to VJ for spotting a a bargain. Now a year later, they had their second hit with uh, that's the Spaniels. Now had their second hit with "Good Night, Sweetheart," and they delivered that one of the all time classic doo-wop songs and I mentioned the Four Tops earlier they formed as the Four Ames in Detroit in 1954 and they changed their name to the Four Tops uh, to avoid confusion with the Ames brothers now the same four guys in the Four Tops were together until 1997 when sadly Lawrence Payton died and also in 1954 at the beginning Johnny Guitar Watson recorded Space Guitar, and that's one of the uh, pioneering works of uh, feedback and reverb. And it was actually, he wrote the song himself, and it was released as Young John Watson, but Johnny Guitar, who was Johnny Guitar Watson, and he was a favourite of Frank Zappa. He appeared um, a number of times with Zappa on stage and on record. Uh, 54 was quite a good year. I mean, the chords recorded and had a number two hit with Shaboom. Now that was originally another one of these that was released as a B-side and the original A-side was their cover of Patty Page's Cross Over the Bridge but DJs preferred the B-side and uh, Shaboom became um, a big hit. But sadly the chords are yet another one destined to the annals of um, One Hit Wonders. But Shaboom actually brings us on to um, an interesting side issue with doo-wop and, and R&B, particularly doo-wop. Groups like the Crew Cuts, some uh, very clean-cut white guys from Canada, and Pat Boone, another very clean-cut uh, early rock and roll singer, they would cover these R&B originals and they would be very much uh, watered down versions of the of the songs and um, sometimes they had more success in the charts than the original black artists did although interestingly enough with the crew cuts that wasn't an r&b or a pop hit in the u.s but it did chart in the uk so the uk gave the crew cuts uh, a number 12 the latter part of 1954 with Shaboom and in the middle of 1954 Bill Haley and his Comets had their first hit with uh, in America with uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll well it actually was their first hit in the UK as well that charted in the UK at the end of 1954 but that was a cover of Big Joe Turner's Shake, Rattle and Roll and it's quite an interesting one from a, a hit point of view. The big Joe Turner version was an R&B hit. I gave him a number one for three weeks, but it wasn't a crossover hit. It didn't hit the pop charts. Whereas Bill Haley's uh, was a hit in the pop charts, a number seven, but that was never a hit in the R&B charts. So the people who decided what was and wasn't an R&B record had some interesting decisions over that particular one. And at the end of 1954, the uh, Penguins achieved um, an R&B number one with Earth Angel. And that crossed over into the pop charts. Uh, number one for three weeks in R&B and a number eight on the crossover in the, in the pop charts. And it's interesting that now we're getting into 1954, 19, late 1954, 1955. And a lot of the songs are starting to cross over into the pop charts another interesting thing about that was it was released in the uk in the january of 55 as was an, most of the r&b material or an awful lot of it and doo-wop 
very little charted and this didn't chart in the UK either and again it's another one to check the attic out if you've got a black label copy of this with gold writing it could well be worth getting on for £2,000 and this is the penguins with Earth Angel well that brings us to the final part of our look at early R&B and doo-wop and one of the most successful groups of that period were the Platters now in 1954 they originally released Only You on the federal label and 18 months later in the middle of 55 it was released again but this time it was on Mercury they'd had some success at um, federal but it was their move to Mercury that really brought them success. And the reason for that was Book Ram, their manager, managed to do a two-for-one deal. He managed the Platters and the Penguins. Now, Mercury were very keen to get hold of the Penguins because they'd been very successful. The Platters hadn't really done a lot at this stage, but uh, Book Ram sorted out a two-for-one deal. Now, the Mercury version was a smash hit for the Platters on both sides of the Atlantic and started a run of hits which lasted into the early 60s. The Platters were one of the most successful of the doo-wop groups, and most of the singles scored on both the R&B and the pop charts. And Only You itself was written by the Platters' manager, Buck Ram. He actually wrote and produced most of their hits. And one for the record collectors, Only You was originally released on Mercury with a purple label to denote it was an R&B release. Mercury used different labels for different genres, uh, country and western for instance was on a green label but shortly after this platter's release mercury dropped the color coding and standardized their releases on black labels only you itself was a was a crossover hit and spent seven weeks on the uh, r&b chart at number one bill haley and his comets had their first r&b number one in early 1955 and that was dim dim the lights and of course any look at R&B in the middle 50s has to include Bo Diddley. And on the 2nd of March 55, Bo Diddley was in the recording studio and cut Bo Diddley and I'm a Man, which were put together and released as his first single. Both sides credited to Bo Diddley, but you find the writing credit mostly on his records goes to E. McDaniels. And both sides gave him a whopping um, number one. He'd been around for a while. I mean, that was 1955 when he got his first hit. And in 1946, he'd formed his first group, the Hipsters, and they became the Langley Avenue Jive Cats. But rock and roll essentially was born on the 25th of March 1955 with the American release of Blackboard Jungle. Now, that was based on a novel by Evan Hunter, set in an inner city New York school against a sort of backdrop of teenage delinquency. The movie opened with a written preamble about the problems of juvenile delinquency, with the opening credits rolling to Bill Haley and his comets rock around the clock. The reaction to the movie was absolutely immediate, kick-started rock and roll around the world. Now, that wasn't the first outing for Rock Around the Clock. It started life as the B-side of 13 Women, uh, released back in May 54. But neither side troubled the, the charts at that particular point. Uh, but when it was uh, released again following the movie, it spent eight weeks at number one. It was actually Bill Haley's fifth hit. And Rock Around the Clock also entered the R&B charts. Uh, gave him his second R&B hit. Now, one of the really big stars of this time was Fats Domino, and he released Ain't It a Shame in the spring of 1955, written by Fats Domino and Dave Bartholomew. It was um, a big crossover hit. It was his 14th R&B hit, and it was an R&B number one for 11 weeks. And it also entered the UK charts. That gave him his third UK hit single, and that was in the January of uh, 57. And really, the last guy will we'll look at and you couldn't look at r&b without him it's chuck berry he recorded maybelline on the 21st of may 1955 he was introduced to the chess brothers who owned the label by muddy waters and this first recording of chess was based on bob will's 1938 recording of ida red now early copies of the writing credit went to chuck berry and dj's russ frato and alan freed 
and again that was a nice big crossover hit and yet another uh, number one for a very long period of time 11 weeks in this particular case well that's it for another show i've been derek shelmerdine you've been listening to the rock and roll unravel show and the story of the early days of r&b it's interesting to see how blues, jazz and jump blues all sort of came together with a little touch of other things to give us R&B and the vocally based doo-wop. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the show as much as I have in putting the whole thing together. If you're into social media, you can find me on Twitter at RNR Unraveled and Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled. I also do a very detailed copy of the show as a blog on my website and that's rockandrollunraveled.com and it's also as well as all the information uh, in the show it's also got links to all of the songs that I talk about in the show so if you want to hear what some of these uh, quite rare songs sound like check out the website and that's rockandrollunraveled.com and join me again next time for another look a little piece of rock and roll unraveled and to play us out who else from 1955 this is chuck berry and maybelline